It ain't the left side or the right side. And it must be the fin side. Thank you, Solo D. Welcome to another episode of On the Fin Side here with Kat and Paul. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Spreaker, iTunes, YouTube, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. Be sure to check out our merch store, too, on the finside.threadless.com. The Bears are three-point favorites in Miami this weekend. Huge matchup for both teams. Chicago is 3-1 and one coming off a of bye week. The Dolphins are 3-2 and two. coming back home trying to stop their skid. Updated injury report as we record this show. Back in practice today was wide receiver Devontae Parker. It looks like Laramie Tunzel came back and took some reps too. At defensive end, Cameron Wake and Andre Branch were suited up. We'll see how they are for this weekend. As well as Bobby McCain getting back out there, closer to action. Maybe we see him a little bit this weekend too when they play the Bears. Bears are relatively healthy. Prince of Mukamura and Eric Cush at the time we're recording the show, are a little bit limited. So we'll see how they are for this weekend. Paul, sometimes bye weeks are good. Sometimes they're bad. For the Chicago Bears, it may not have been a good thing because they scored 48 points the last time they were on the field against the Bucks. Maybe the Dolphins are the team that needed the bye week. What is your overall feeling heading into this game? Well, for one, it still feels weird. Anytime that there's a team having a bye week this early in the season, it always feels weird to hear they're coming off the bye week. But I'm hopeful. I'm going to go with hopeful on this one. I mean, the Bears are a tough matchup. I know they started off a little funky, we'll go with. But really, they are a tough matchup. They've got a lot of good skill position players. They've got a good young quarterback in Trubisky. And Khalil Mack is playing all world or all galaxy football right now. I mean, it's he's single-handedly taken over a few games already since he's gone to Chicago. A rejuvenated Khalil Mack is a scary thing. But went out in one of our segments with Bob Witt earlier this week taking a look from the other team's sidelines. Juwan James actually played pretty well against Khalil Mack the last two the time the last time the two of them squared off. And I know you had pointed out that that Juwan James plays well against speed rushers, but I just I think he's one of those players that rises and falls to the level of his competition, it, which is an odd thing to be able to do better against an all-world player than you can against some practice scrub, squad scrub. But it seems to hold true with Juwan James. Yeah, and looking at James, if the last two games the Patriots at defensive end, they've got more power players and guys like Trey Flowers. And this past week, Carlos Dunlop, 6'6", 290, was one of the worst games James has had in a while. But when they played the Raiders last year in Monday Night Football, James shut him down and then got hurt. Sam Young comes in, and you know how the rest of that goes. So that's a huge matchup. If the Dolphins can neutralize Khalil Mack with Juwan James in a one-on-one, I'm not saying that's going to happen. And we could look back Sunday night and be eating these words, but that would be a huge thing because then they would also on the other side, there's not a big pass rush on the other side for the bears. Leonard Floyd, former first round pick has been a big disappointment. Akeem Hicks on the interior there, very good football player. He's going to go up against Ted Larson. He is. And you know, one thing I'm going to throw out there just because he got released this week. I know you and I talked about it offline what would your feelings be? And I'd love to hear what our listeners think of it down in the, down, down in the comments. But what are your feelings about the thought of Miami potentially signing an Eric Flowers on a one-year prove-it deal and kicking him into guard? And then you could move Larson into center if you wanted to or just off the field on the, on the whole. But you know I loved him as, as the thought of putting him at guard when he was coming out of the draft. And I think it protects a lot of his weaknesses if you did something like that. What would, what would your thoughts be in that regard? I, I'm fine with signing flowers and just seeing what happens, but I wouldn't specifically sign him and say, okay, we really need to this week or next week get him in at left guard and move Larson to center. Very simply because, to my understanding, flowers has never played guard before. So that's a huge transition. And then if you move Larson to center, I don't think it would make a lot of sense this week because Travis Swanson – played really well against the Bengals last week. And so I'm fine with just seeing him as a, as a why not 
and maybe having him be a, a backup swing tackle, because I don't care how bad he was in New York, he can't be as bad as Zach Stirrup and as bad as Sam Young. So I would, why not? But that's pretty much as far as I've thought about it. So anyway, looking at the rest of, of the Bears offense, Mitchell Trubisky, the last he has a quarterback rating of 101.6 on the year. But before this last game against the Bucks, where he had six touchdowns and no interceptions, he only had two touchdowns and three interceptions in the first three games. Very much looked like a rookie. Pro Football Focus had him as one of the lowest rated quarterbacks. Statistically, he only had a quarterback rating of 78. So, you know, this could be just a quarterback who is still young, who's still learning it, and he reverts back to who he was in the in the first four games, especially with that Dolphins pass rush and their league leading secondary in interceptions. I'm going to go back to to some of what we've talked about in our game reviews recently. It's not the Bears' offense that scares me because, as you pointed out, the Dolphins lead the league in interceptions right now. And that's kind of a combo effort between the secondary and Kiko Alonso right now, but really as a whole, their defense has been playing very well. I know they'll give up some yards, but God, I think they've got four or five goal line stands already this season. I don't have the exact number in front of me. They've shut down a lot of opposing offenses. They've shut down what opposing offenses want to do outside of, you know, the Patriots getting Sony Michelle active on the ground all of a sudden. And their offense doesn't scare me because I think our defense is better and matches up very well. Our, their special teams don't scare me because I think our special teams are better and match up very well. What scares me the most isn't even their defense. It's our offense and our play calling. It's, I know I touched on it briefly when we talked to Bob Witt, but really Miami has shot themselves in the foot in both losses, not just in terms of blocking, but in terms of poor decision-making, in terms of poor play calling. And really, it's this is time for Gase to show that he can learn from these mistakes and open things up, in which case Miami can win this game. But if Gase doesn't do that and get a little creative here, we might be in for a long afternoon, despite the fact that the defense and the special team should show up and play well yet again in this game. When it comes to the offensive struggles, I mean, I really take the opposite opinion of that. I mean, I'm not saying the play calling has been good, but my my issue with with that is last game, I did think they were getting Kenyon Drake involved in the passing game. I did think they were running receivers deeper. I look at the All-22, and I see receivers, at least on three or four plays, running open. I mean, for example, a lot of people complain, a lot of Dolphins fans complained about on third and one, instead of running the ball, which maybe they should have, they roll out with Ryan Tannehill. Well, when Tannehill rolls out, he's got a first down. And then instead, he just throws the ball up to a receiver that's not even open. You're starting to see too many of those decisions from Ryan Tannehill in the passing game. And it's got to stop. I think he's got it in his head that he has to be more aggressive this year. And because of that, He's not at certain times taking what's right in front of him. So I hope that changes this week. But bottom line, Ryan Tannehill's got to get better. He does. And and I'm not going to put all of that on Tannehill. I know a few of our listeners also said the same thing, where the offensive line play, I mean, we've beat it to death, but it's not good right now. And it's also not the offensive line that that Miami designed in the offseason. So – yeah, the fact that Tannehill's making some poor rush decisions at times or trying to take on a little too much, some of that might be a byproduct of that. Also, the fact that they get away from the run game and go one-dimensional with the offense pretty much, as games wear on a lot of times. So you find defenses, even when Miami has a lead, can pin their ears back and just rush the passer and be right 99% of the time. And even if, say, Frank Gore – or Kenyon Drake, or or anybody else rips off a big run, Miami will still deviate from that. And I don't have as much of a problem with the pass play on third and one. I have more of a problem with Miami being in third and 10, third and 11, and running give up plays well short of the sticks, or you know running plays every time, or wide receiver screens every time. I mean, it's a low percentage play, and Gates is supposed to be all about the high percentage plays, and yet 
over and over again, we see the low percentage calls going out in the field. Yeah, I also don't like going five wide when it's second and seven, where you basically tell the defense, even though we're running the ball well, we are definitely passing the ball in this down. So the play calling has not anywhere been close to great this year. Offensive line in the fourth quarter, like I said in our grades last week, fourth quarter was an F minus minus minus. It was so bad, I, I you had to you had to see it to believe it. In the first three quarters, I didn't have much of a problem with them protecting Ryan Tannehill. I mean, I know Jesse Davis gave up an embarrassing sack. Ted Larson also gave up, if not a sack, it was a huge pressure. But other than that, I don't think Tannehill was under constant pressure in the first three quarters, and they still were not able to move the ball. So this, But here's the good news on it, Paul. The Dolphins seem to wake up a lot more and seem to play a lot better on offense when they're at home. And because of that, it's going to be a. Uh, hopefully, the Dolphins get a few more lucky breaks their way, and they get they play a lot better because the running day game is starting to get a little bit better. I think Frank Gore got a lot of chunk yards last week, five, six, seven yards consistently, and Kenyon Drake, I thought, had a fantastic game, and they better continue to get him more involved in the passing game. God, I hope so, and and, and I hope it's not on the continued same route because Miami's found the most success this year when they've done some exotic things, whether it's splitting Drake out wide and moving Albert Wilson into the backfield, you know, and doing some exotic shifts, doing some creative plays as far as bringing people into chip block that you wouldn't expect and run a trap play. I mean, over and over again, when Miami's found success, it's been on those creative plays that keep defenses on their toes. And it works on the plays that aren't the creative ones in between, because defenses have to keep their head on a swivel. Defenses have to keep overly reading the play, which holds a player for sometimes even a half a second to a full second and allows good things to happen and players to get in space, which Miami's offense is completely built to put players in space and create mismatches and confusion. So they need to do that. It's They're not built to run – you know, power eye every play with the personnel that they have. They're built to run creatively, which you and I both have, have expressed wanting to see. They finally have the personnel to do it, and they're not doing it right now. Yeah, and it's interesting with Drake and with Tariq Cohen on the other side, because I think these are two, receiving-wise, two of the best running backs in the league as far as just splitting them out and having play that that underneath receiver role, you know, that touchdown to Drake last week, that's a run. That's a route. The Dolphins should be running with Drake that, that out and up to the corner of the end zone. They should be running that play five times a game. And so should the bears, the bears woke up last week or two weeks ago as well with Tariq Cohen. He had seven catches for 121 yards. I have a tough time deciding when I was watching the bucks bears game, is the bears offense really this good? Or did they wake up with Tariq Cohen? And now he was the central central point of the passing game, and it freed up everybody else to, to be in one-on-one coverage. Could be a bigger game for Jerome Baker against Tariq Owen, controlling that speedy running back. It could be. I mean, it, it's Miami could do some very interesting things here, and if if Drake is able to get open and be effective uh, in this one, it just opens up everything for this team. So yeah, hopefully they get them involved. Yeah, Paul. So what do you think the dolphins, in addition to what we've talked about, what do you think they need to do to win? And what is your prediction? In all honesty, I know I'm, I'm beating a dead horse here, but they need to get creative on offense. They need to get creative with their play calling. They need to keep Tannehill off his ass and, and, and really just do some, do some creative things because the defense and the special teams, they played well enough to win last week. Miami, at the very least, if you go off those two units, should be four and one right now. And they're not. They're three and two. You know, they're the fifth seed in the AFC right now, I believe, or the seventh. Uh, and they could very easily get back into it. Uh, this is going to be the last week that I think Gay starts to, to realize it before I finally start to cave and think he doesn't. Um, so I think Miami pulls it out here. I think it's closer than I'd like it to be, but I think 23-20 Miami. Two ways I look at this. Number one, the Dolphins 
have to be just pissed off after last week, blowing a 17 nothing lead in a, in a stadium that they have not always done very well in in Cincinnati. Now they come back home. They've got the Bears at home, and part of me thinks that they're going to rebound. But one matchup that I just can't get over is that the Bears' offensive line and watching that unit on tape in several games has been really good this year. And I don't think the Dolphins' defense works very well if they're not pressuring the quarterback consistently. I think they're going to struggle to do that again. That's why I'm going to go with the Bears by the score of 27 to 23 here. But man, oh man, if the Dolphins can pull this off. I mean, now that you get past the Patriots and Bengals game, Look at the next really two months. You've got the Bears here at home, then the Lions at home. So two very winnable games at Houston on Thursday night. That's another winnable game. The Jets at home. We've already beat the Jets. Now we've got them at home. At Green Bay is a tough game. Then the bye week. Then you've got at Indianapolis, who isn't very good, and the Bills at home. So that's that's a stretch right there, especially with that bye week, that if the Dolphins can pull it out and get to 4-2, and two, we may be heading into the final four games of the year and saying, you know what, maybe we only have to win one or two of these to get into the playoffs. No, completely, but it, it's it's all got to start right here. I mean, they have a winnable stretch coming up. I know we keep talking about that, but really they have to start in the here and now. They have to start doing the things that are going to make this team successful, and to do that, they need to kick the offense into gear here. I mean, even Gase came out and said it last week. You know, he's embarrassed that his offense – didn't play well enough to win because everybody else deserved a W. So it's put yeah, up or shut up time for Gase. The flip side of that is if the Dolphins lose here convincingly, but when they come back home, I'm not sure if they can beat any of these teams coming up. And that's a scary proposition. So I'm going to say with stick with 27 to 23 Bears. And that will do it for our breakdown of the Miami Dolphins Chicago Bears matchup. Be sure to tune in noon central time to see that game and root on your Miami Dolphins. They certainly need it here in this big game. You're listening to Cat and Paul. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Spreaker, iTunes, YouTube, and on iHeartRadio. Be sure to check out our merchandise store on the finside.threadless.com. And if it's not on the right side and it's not on the left side, it is on the fin side. It ain't the left side or the right side, and it must be the fin side. It ain't the left side, left side or the right, right side. side, and it must be the fifth left. Listen, Dolphins fans across the land all tuning in to see what Brian Cat and Paul about to do.